Hi, this is Charles Matthews. I'm the architect here with Grizzly Bear Architecture and Design. And today we are looking at how to design a tenant improvement. Today we are looking at how to design a tenant improvement. Now, before we get started, I just want to describe what a tenant improvement is. Now, a tenant improvement is what happens when a business wants to rent a space in a building and they need something to happen on the inside of that building in order to make that inside work with the intended function that is going to be happening inside of the building. And so a tenant improvement can also be known as, uh, I, I've heard it referred to as a, a build out, uh, but for our purposes today, we're looking at it from a viewpoint of what is a tenant improvement and how to design a tenant improvement. So our first step is we need to understand what the client wants. When I refer to the client, obviously I'm talking about the architectural client, the client of the architect. And this client is the one who is going into the space. However, we do have uh, other people who are involved in the process, the general contractor, and the developer or the owner of the property. But as the architect, your, your top priority is making sure that the client is happy. And so you need to understand what the client wants. When you're designing the tenant improvement, the way that you can help the client understand the impact of what they want is by conducting what is called a construction feasibility analysis uh, where among other things you can show the cost of architectural services the cost of construction and the time that's required for construction so let's say a person is wanting to do a restaurant and they begin to think of all the different kinds of food that they will be serving and the different feeling that they want the people to have when they walk into it. But they may not understand necessarily what the governing ag agencies of the city or the county agency will, will need. And so understanding what the governing agencies require is important, such as uh, what would the planning department need? Maybe they won't need anything. Maybe they will, but you'd still need to determine that. Would the engineering of for the city need anything special to be done? Like for a restaurant, uh, the way that grease is disposed of is an important aspect of what's to be considered. Building and safety requirements, fire prevention, health department, all these various agencies have some say in what's going to be developed and how things are done. And you have to understand that for the most part, these agencies requirements are, are not to give you trouble in developing your project as much as they are to make sure that your project is fitting according to things that have been found over time to be helpful such as with the health department, uh, how you use water. Are you going to be serving water to your customers or is it just for use of washing your hands? Well, regardless, there are different things that need to happen, different maybe even signage that needs to be posted related to employees washing hands, those kind of things. Those are all building code requirements uh, as impacted by the governing agencies. Speaking of building codes, we now look at understanding the code requirements and there are three things that go into uh, understanding the code requirements or, or trying to follow what the code requirements say. The first is use of the tenant improvement. What is the tenant improvement going to be? Is it a business? Is it a restaurant? Is it a theater? Is it a uh, nail salon? You have a variety of different things going into spaces. And so if you have that variety, you have to make sure that 
the building is protected, the inhabitants are protected based on the use. So you have to know the use of the tenant improvement. What is its size? And you need to know the gross size of the space, but more importantly, the net size. So it would be the area minus the circulation that's needed in order for, say, the restaurant to break even. Are, are they going to have enough chairs and tables there for people to eat in order to gain a certain amount of cash flow in order to make the project viable? And finally, uh, looking at the issue of sprinklers. Now, sprinklers, by now, by the time you're hearing this video, are going to be required for not only commercial, but also residential construction. And so what a sprinklered space does is it helps uh, save the building by way of saving people's lives, by uh, way of spraying water into the area if there is a fire in the area. And so if the building is sprinklered, then there is a greater amount of space that can be involved. Now, it does cost more money to have a sprinkled space. And so that being said, uh, you have to understand the trade-offs and the benefits. It is becoming less uh, possible for people to have buildings without sprinklers. So that goes to show just what a uh, what a tremendous asset they are to a building. So in understanding how to design a tenant improvement after we have thought of understanding what the client wants, understanding what the governing agencies require, and understanding the code requirements, the fourth thing that we need to consider is the, uh, the client's design goals. We do that by way of the design process iterations. I say iteration, it's just a technical way of saying it's something that you do over and over again. Uh, there are cycles in each iteration of research, schematic arrangements, that means putting things on paper and showing, or, or in the computer, and showing where the different items are going to be. Then you take those designs and you communicate it to the client by way of a drawing, by way of a computer animated model. Uh, it, it all depends on what they would best communicate the work to the client. So after you communicate it to the client, uh, they'll have the opportunity to refine the design and then after they tell you what things to change you then start over to some degree now it, it wouldn't be as hard as starting over from scratch although in some cases it may be necessary to start over from scratch but the design iteration process is ending because you're going back into the cycle of research, schematic arrangements, communicating with the client, refining the design. And so you go through this until either the client approves or you run out of time or you run out of money. So it's a process of synthesizing the, uh, the various elements in the design. So after you have arrived at the basic idea of what you want the building to be. Most of the time this is done in the concept or schematic design phase. Afterwards we look at the building by way of design development. Design development as a process is where more details are added and the building is fleshed out significantly more. And after reaching design development it's then in a place where the building can be submitted to consultants. Construction documents are the final phase as far as the architect is concerned and the construction documents bring the consultants work and the architects work together to make sure that they are 
all coordinated. After the construction documents are made, then there's a process of plan check. That's when the building is submitted to, and by way of drawings, the building is submitted to the governing agency, most likely the building and safety department. And in being submitted, it's reviewed and compared with the code and other requirements and just to verify that everything that the designer, the architect wants to accomplish can be accomplished without jeopardizing life, health, and safety. And finally, approval. After plan check has happened, and by the way, plan check is a process also. There can be multiple submittals for plan check, especially after you submit it once. The plans may come back as needing more changes added to them. And so that can be a process as well. And finally, as I was mentioning, there is submittal. Uh, I'm sorry. Finally, as I was mentioning, there is approval. So all the plans have been submitted and all the changes that the building and safety department wanted are integrated into the design package. And so now there is approval, which means basically the contractor will be able to pick up the permit and begin the constructing of the tenant improvement. So with the approval process, uh, that is uh, something that happens after the whole back and forth between the uh, building and safety department and the architect and the client after they've gone back and forth between the various design iterations and refinements that were required by the building and safety department after those things have happened you get approval uh, and so that happens after a solution is reached so there you have it that is the big picture overview of how to design a tenant improvement Hi, this is Charles Matthews. Just wanted to say thanks for watching the video. If you have any thoughts or comments, feel free to leave those below. And visit our website at grizzlybeararchitecture.com. This video is one in a series of videos that address various issues surrounding architecture and our practice of architecture and grizzly bear architecture. And uh, if you have any thoughts or comments, I'd really appreciate those. Thanks.